This is as bad as the Second World War. We've got the economic crisis, which you've described. We have the English or the England crisis, which was revealed by the riots. We have the British crisis uh, in terms of the relationship between the constituent elements of the disunited kingdom. And we have the European crisis, to which you also refer. Now, it seems to me that taken together, these four crises offer both the necessity and the chance, the opportunity, of doing another Disraeli and of rescuing, and I dare to use the word, both England and the party. I believe passionately that history is not a passive thing. As Churchill, that great historian and the greatest prime minister of the 20th century, was for his for Churchill, history was feckered. History created. History enabled you to understand better and to see more clearly. And our present situation is one which has happened before, almost literally, in detail. And the solution is there too with the founder of modern Toryism. A man who is iconic in all sorts of ways as our first Jewish Prime Minister, of course, he's sensibly converted, uh, which is much easier for him, uh, and the founder of modern Toryism, Benjamin Disraeli. Mm -hmm. Disraeli confronted an extraordinarily situ similar situation to the present. Nowadays, we have a politics which, as I shall say, very foolishly concentrates on the middle deeply unfertile ground to the Tories. That is exactly what Disraeli found himself with. The Reform Act of 1832 created an overwhelmingly middle-class electorate that was instinctively liberal. Now, Disraeli's solution is one that is, we know what it is. It's called One Nation Toryism. Now, One Nation Toryism is a term that is banded around a very great deal at the moment. But what it is not is at least as important as what it is. One Nation Toryism is not an appeal to the middle ground. That is exactly what it is not, because that middle ground then as now is occupied by the anti-Tory liberal middle class. What One Nation Toryism is, is a reaction, because again, Churchill, uh, he did write one novel, but he mainly wrote history. Disraeli, of course, was a great novelist, and he used the political novel as a way of envisaging society. And in his novel, Sybil, he wrote about the two worlds of the rich and the poor, the two nations, the rich and the poor. And for Disraeli, the two extremes, the really rather well off and the very badly off, had much more in common than the prosperous, grab grind, awful, self righteous buggers in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> and still seems to me to be absolutely the right analysis. And in other words, this is what one nation Toryism means. It essentially means the elite appealing to the bottom. And I still think that is absolutely possible. And there was the most brilliant obituary, of course, the 19th century, we are mere parasites upon it. Um, the 19th century Britain was so brilliant linguistically as, as well as creatively. And if, you know, Manchester at the moment is simply a pretending village, a shopping mall. It has absolutely no economic function behind it at all. But these buildings were once yeah. new. And at that age, one of the great obituaries put it like this. Disraeli, like a sculptor, looking at a block of marble and seeing a winged angel within it, looked at the working class and saw solid Tory voters. And ladies and gentlemen, Disraeli, like that sculptor, was white. He began the enfranchisement of the working class in 1867, 
and it's more or less completed for men in 1884. And from that point onwards, the Tories become and remain for the next 150, the next 110 years, the National <coughs> Party government. The Cameroons call themselves One Nation Tories, but they are not. There is nothing further from what I've been described than current government policy. Instead, modernizing or detoxifying the Tory brand is designed to make Toryism appealing to the Gonadin reading middle class. This is a waste of time. <laughs> It is a complete and absolute waste of time. They will not vote Tory. And much, much more interestingly, there are not very many of them. We had this wonderful moment at which their numbers were tested precisely. It was called the AV referendum. And it was about 20%. I think there were two constituencies where there was actually a majority for AV, and I live in one of them in London, it was Islington, and the other was These are places that don't matter. They really <laughs> There is another utter and complete misconception, which is imitating Tony Blair. Oh. The whole point, I'm not talking about whether he's a liar, which is, but let's who he was, and whether his policies, which were disasters, which they were. I'm talking about, because in politics, you have to do all sorts of horrible things if you want power. It's simply that it won't work. The whole point about Blair was that he was not a Tory in terms of party label. You can capture the soft right from the left, as he did, but you cannot capture the soft left from the right as Cameron is trying to do, because they are too instinctively hostile. And until that very simple strategic point is understood, we are going to have disaster. And finally, and above all, the Cameroons refuse to invoke nationalism. Hence the present crisis. But the key element, and this is where I connect with the Bruges, the key element of Disraeli, of Baldwin, of Churchill, of Thatcher, is patriotism. The foundation of the free politics is the nation, and the heart of the nation is nationalism, a word that we have not dared to utter, and we must particularly at moments of crisis. What would it have been like at the beginning of the Second World War if Churchill had said, I'm terribly sorry, we can't really be very rude about the Germans. You know, we do, do believe in diversity and equality of opportunity. And after all, we've got to respect Mr. Hitler. And we must really get the I'm sure everybody's got a right to discriminate against Jews. But can you imagine? Can you imagine? Never let a good crisis get to waste. Because, of course, we've actually got four of them. We've got the economic crisis, which you've described. We have the English or the England crisis, which was revealed by the Ryans. We have the British crisis uh, in terms of the relationship between the constituent elements of the disunited kingdom. And we have the European crisis, to which you also refer. Now, it seems to me that taken together, these four crises offer both the necessity and the chance, the opportunity, of doing another Disraeli and of rescuing, I am going to dare to use the word, both England and the party. Now, the economic crisis. As was brutally said by Andrew Thierry, this requires sensible, serious reform in education, in welfare, in public housing, and immigration. And the key point, ladies and gentlemen, is that all of these are profoundly popular amongst the C1s. A sensible policy on public housing, who gets it? I.e. those who are serious citizens, 
and work and are responsible. A proper policy on welfare that the shirkers don't get it and the hard workers who temporarily fall on our tough times do. On immigration, the need to limit it, but without prejudicing those who are here already. None of this is anything to do with racism. None of this is anything to do with denigrating existing communities. And we must understand this. And finally, education policies which are colorblind, class blind, and blind to everything apart from talent. These are popular. And it is absurd that we back the opposite. What is completely preposterous is to back greed, to make fuel more expensive, to make gas more expensive, to cover the countryside in wind farms that are purchased from China and will do absolutely nothing whatever to solve the power crisis. This is demented. This is the morality of a Chris Spoon. We all know what that is. And it also <laughs> assumes that the typical Tory voter is Zach Gelson. We all know how reasonable a view that is of the Tories and our Tory voters and the British and the English. Because I think also, beyond that economic crisis, there's another central issue, which is the England crisis, the riots. Now, I have already spoken sensationally, in every sense of the word, on this subject. And I'm going to repeat it. The riots were manifestly about a particular kind of gang culture which began amongst blacks and was adopted by whites. There could be absolutely no sensible disagreement on this. If you don't believe me, listen to Darkus Howe. And he says exactly that. Listen to Tony Parsons. And he says exactly that. But what none of those people do is to ask why this stuff which is spurious, is preposterous, has been satirized by Ali G, why it has such purchase. The reason that it does is because in England, and particularly in the south of England and the Midlands, there is a complete vacuum of identity. People do not know who they are. In other words, to understand the riots, we need to know not simply where they took place, but where they did not take place. They did not take place in Scotland. They did not take place in Wales. They did not take place in Northern Ireland. And they did not take place in some of the most important and poorest regions of England, like the North East and Yorkshire. Because what all of these areas have in common is that they know what they are. Now, I have a terrible problem here. I have been historically and viscerally opposed to traditional notions of nationalism, and I'm on record as saying that I think it's a glory of the English that we are about the only people in Western Europe who don't pretend to have a national dress. But there is now a real problem. Without a sense of nationalism, you cannot have a sense of common identity. You cannot have a sense of common purpose. And of course, in a crisis, what you need is a sense of common purpose. <coughs> Why do the rich in England behave as monstrously as they do? Because they have no sense of common purpose. Because the city of London has become a city-state, complete with a fool, jest, a despot uh, in Boris Johnson, you know, <laughs> and completely remote from anything else that is happening in Britain, and with absolutely no sense of responsibility towards it. And why are we in this position? Above all, because post-Powell, English nationalism was identified with racism. Once the do London doctors had marched on the side of Powell, they were not to be trusted because they were racist. And look in the aftermath of the riots, after Clapham had been looted and burned, uh, after Hackney had been looted and burned, after Tottenham had been looted and burned, a handful of whites marched in Enfield and marched in Elton, at which point I think it was 5,000 police turned out to stop. This is lunatic. This is an absurdity. This is disgraceful. Now, it seems to me, thanks to those other two crises, we can actually do something about it in a way that we never could before. The first is the British crisis, and the second is the European crisis. The British crisis, Labour's piecemeal devolution, 
means that Britain, and let us face it, as a unitary state, is dead. Absolutely stone dead. And the debate yesterday about the United Kingdom demonstrated this. It was led by three secretaries of state who have titles, income, offices, officers, and have absolutely bugger all responsibility for anything. If you wanted to cut government waste, close the Scottish office, close the Welsh office, close the Northern Ireland office. They can do absolutely nothing about the areas where they are. Now, it is ludicrous and it is dement. Now, it seems to me that for, as Tories, we were one time the Unionist Party. We should be the first to recognise this. It's fact to cut the boil and Rhodesia and whatever. It also, of course, carries huge electoral advantage to the party since England is supremely Tory territory. An English parliament would probably never have a Labour majority. But till recently, of course, the recognition that England should have exactly the same status as Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland was impossible because it would have meant the complete breakup of the UK. The reason for this is the European crisis. Because until a few years ago, the EU would have offered a welcoming and apparently pain free home to an independent Scotland or perhaps an independent Wales, and perhaps even because it loves stateless, as they're dependent creatures you know, whose mouths open and shut, uh, rather like goldfish to the crumbs of the front end of them, Northern Ireland as well. But, ladies and gentlemen, the European crisis, or rather the Euro crisis, has put pain to that. Scotland is too canny to vote for independence and the euro. Instead, and I take a level bet, it will settle the home rule and the pound. This opens the way to a British confederation, perhaps even reincorporating the Irish Republic, an English Westminster Parliament, and a revived English nationalism, which will build on our historic success, what I referred to with Disraeli, with Churchill, with Baldwin, with Thatcher, in incorporating previously excluded groups, whether the white working class or immigrant communities, into the historic, generous, open, involving, decent English polity. All these things we should be boasting about. All of these things, we are not responsible for them. We are the fortunate inheritors. And it seems to me that this is the right place to be talking about. The Bruges group, although it is easily rubbish, as being obsessed with Europe, the other face of it, as it were, that's the negative face. The positive face of the Bruges group, and its great distinction is in this fact, is in recognizing that the foundation of a decent <coughs> politics is nationhood. National sovereignty and a responsible political system. And everything else is anti-democratic. I hate to say this word, the two Ds, Diversity is anti-democratic. The only way you can run highly diverse groups, in other words, multicultural communities or multinational units is by empire. It's by top-down government, which is why the bloody French are so keen on it. The thing is a Napoleonic imposition. And ladies and gentlemen, you need either bureaucratic rule or imperial rule or preferably a combination. So this is the natural place to be talking about this, but also, ladies and gentlemen, to revive England and the astonishing, I don't know whether you've read that rather nice little Welshman, Simon Jenkins' new history of England, he says at the end of it, he has become a passionate English nationalist, because he looks at what England has done. England invented modernity. England invented limited government, representative government, the rule of law, capitalism, you all think I've gone mad. It's not true. It's not happening. This is what we actually did. All of these things actually began here. It's our job to make sure they don't stop here. And it also seems to me to be a natural task for a revived Tory party, which I don't think we are at the moment. If we embark seriously on this exercise of the incorporation, reincorporation of the working class and immigrant communities, within the kind of vision that I'm offering, we would win the North once more for Tories. It would give us, as a nation, the sense of common purpose that we desperately need in these tough times of financial crisis. And if you were up to it, it would make David Cameron genuinely his own man. Is he big enough?
and that I fear is a rhetorical question.